live from Mitchell Hall at the University of Delaware. This is Delaware Debates. Welcome. On behalf of Delaware First Media, WDDE 91.1 FM, and the University of Delaware Center for Political Communication, I'm Nancy Karabjanian, and welcome to Delaware Debates 2012, made possible with the financial support of AARP Delaware and the American Cancer Society Cancer Action Network. I am joined this evening by University of Delaware Professor of Political Science and International Relations, David Wilson, who will be helping to co-moderate tonight's debate featuring the candidates in the race for Delaware governor, including the incumbent, Jack Markell, the Democrat, and the Republican candidate, Jeff Craig. Welcome to both of you. Now, tonight's debate is divided into two parts. Following your one-minute opening statement, David and I will be putting questions to each of you. During this section, you will have one minute and 30 seconds to respond, followed up by a one-minute rebuttal, and then we will have a follow-up discussion among the four of us. Then we're going to be turning to students from the University of Delaware and Delaware State University for their questions. Responses in this section are limited to one minute. Each candidate will also have a one-minute closing statement. Our live audience here in Mitchell Hall on the University of Delaware's Newark campus understands that will be no applause during tonight's debate. And a coin toss did determine our order for this evening. And with that decision, we begin with Jack Markell, who has the first opening statement. Thank you. You know, I've been privileged these last four years to serve the people of Delaware as their governor. Uh, four years ago, they put their faith in me at a very difficult time. The stock market was collapsing. The economy was in free fall. Delaware was losing 15,000 jobs a year. Major employers were shutting their doors. They were laying off their workers, and they were moving out of state. We faced the biggest budget shortfall in our history. And I've been proud about how the people of Delaware have pulled together. We've shown that we really are a state of neighbors. And working together, we've been reopening shuttered plants. We're putting people back to work. And once again, we're making Delaware a choice location for businesses to locate and create jobs. We're moving forward here in Delaware, but we have more to do. And that's why I'm once again asking the people of Delaware for their confidence and for their vote. Jeff Craig, your opening statement. Uh, thank you. Um, this election in my candidacy about, is about jobs and the economy. Delaware has over 30,200 unemployed individuals. That's the population of Newark, Delaware, plus 3,000 individuals. Or for the people here at the university, it's the capacity of the Delaware Stadium, plus the Bob Carpenter Center, plus 3,000 people. It's an unacceptable large number. We've not recovered economically from the downturn at the beginning of Jack's administration. In addition to that, we have a shocking number of people in our state who are on food stamps. It was 87,000 or 11% of the population that was on food stamps at the beginning of Jack's term. Today, it's 152,000 or 17% of the population that's on food stamps. We've made some progress, but we haven't made enough progress. This election and our debate tonight is about different visions for how to move Delaware forward. And so I'm interested in moving forward and getting going. Thank Let's get you. to the questions then. And our first question will be posed to Jack Markell. The cracks in Delaware's economy broke open with the financial industry free fall and the credit crisis. Delaware built its foundation on the money industry. And now it is obvious that the state was far too dependent upon banks and for its financial stability. Now, if I read the list of the companies that are now helping Delaware rebuild, Barclays, Citigroup, Amazon, They've all made a commitment to the first state, but it, it sounds like the state is in the midst of a big rebound if you read it just on the paper. But the numbers aren't adding up and unemployment figures aren't really changing. It's still kind of bleak. So where is this bullish message coming from on Delaware's economic future? Is it reality or just spin? No, of course it's reality. And the fact is the unemployment numbers were actually significantly better than the national average. Uh, we. At the same time, we recognize that at a 6.9% unemployment rate, there are 30,000 people in our state who want to be working and who are not. And so we're going to be relentlessly focused on putting them back to work. But the facts are, J.P. Morgan Chase is adding 1,200 jobs. Amazon is building, almost finished up, a million square foot distribution facility. They'll be putting 1,000 people to work there. Bloom Energy is building a new factory uh, a mile or two uh, from here, where they'll be employing hundreds. The Valero refinery was closed. 
it has reopened. It's, it's probably the only refinery in the country that, ha that, is, that had closed and is now reopened. Bank of America is laying 30,000 people off across the country. They're adding 500 jobs here in Delaware. Capital One bought ING Direct. We were worried about where those jobs would go. They're adding 500 jobs here in Delaware in addition to Capital One. Testing Machines, Inc., the uh, uh, FlowSmart, MySherpa, Miller Metal, all of these companies and dozens more adding jobs as well. We're putting people back to work. We've certainly got a ways to go and we're gonna, be, we're gonna continue to focus on that. You have a one minute rebuttal before our follow up discussion. Uh, the answer is spin. When we have 30,200 unemployed people and there's another 18,000 who are underemployed, people who have taken jobs part time, people who are working multiple jobs, uh, people who have taken a job, they're not using their educational background or their training. Um, the food stamp numbers show how tough the economy is. 17% of the people on food stamps. I'm glad we have unemployment programs. I'm glad we have food stamp programs. And I'm glad that we've had a number of, of, of companies that have come to Delaware. But essentially, we haven't done enough. We still have too much burdensome regulation. We still raise taxes going into this recession, which we need to roll back gross receipts tax, uh, personal income tax. And we need to create a stable business environment uh, when Jack ran, he put together in his book, A Blueprint for Delaware, that it's not the job of the government to create jobs, but to create an environment. We haven't done a good enough job creating that environment, and that's borne out by the numbers. Let's go into the follow-up discussion. Where do we stand on your blueprint for Delaware? Uh, we've implemented the majority of uh, items in there. Uh, we've still got more to go. Some of them were, uh, we didn't have the resources. I wanted to, you know, I said in the blueprint, we ought to create a Delaware version of a, uh, a cops bill. Uh, we've not been able to add as many, uh, uh, as much to that as we'd like to, uh, but we've, we've actually made progress there as well. You know, Mr. Craig can say it's spin. It's not spin to the hundreds of workers who are back at the refinery. It's not spin to the people at Testing Machine Zinc who decided to expand in Delaware. It's not spin to the folks at uh, Fox Fire Printing who are adding dozens of jobs. It's not spin to the 1,200 people who are going to be at J.P. Morgan Chase. You can say it's spin. The fact is these are real jobs, real families being put back being put back to work. We're in discussion, so feel free to offer your opinion. Again, it's been 30,200 unemployed, 18,000 additional individuals who have dropped out of the workforce, people who've taken part-time jobs. You know, we can argue back and forth about what the numbers, but on election day, those people go to the polls and they will make a decision based on their own personal experience. But in your campaign, you have cited the high percentage of people in Delaware who earn their paycheck from the government. So if you were to trim down the government, aren't we just exasperating the problem? Uh, I moved to, to Delaware in the late 1980s, and the largest employer was the DuPont Company. Today, the largest employer is the state of Delaware. The second largest employer is the federal government. We have made our economy more and more dependent on government, which means higher taxes, which means a slower growth long-term economy. What we need to do to turn this economy down is trim down the drag of government and increase the entrepreneurship and the private sector, and when you grow the private sector. Does that sector, mean jobs, though? Trim down jobs. When you say trim down the drag of government, do you mean trim jobs? What we need to do is we need to hold, hold the rate of growth of government to no more than the rate of inflation, which means 1% or 2% a year. I don't think Jack disagrees with me on that. Well, and not only do I not disagree, but in fact, we've done it. The average growth since I took office in state spending is 1.7%. We are the only administration going all the way back to the DuPont administration where our state government headcount is lower than it was. So I mean that, we, we have been not very focused. Not counting teachers. Not counting teachers. The agencies under our control within the cabinet, the 16 cabinet departments, the only administration going back, uh, all the way back to the DuPont administration. And it's not been through layoffs, it's been through a very careful management uh, of the attrition. No other administration, Democrat or Republican, can say that. We're, make, we're moving in the right direction. We, we've seen the governor's record on jobs. What about yours? As a, a business owner, can you tell us something about how you were able to create jobs or maybe how you manage well, for, well, first of all, a couple things. It's not the government's role to create jobs. It's the government's role to create the it's environment. It's your skills as governor that's going to lead sure, you to create jobs, Sure, and I, job, and I right? have a 24-year career in the life and health insurance industry working with large employers all, all over the country. Successful companies. Successful companies. Most jobs start out with an unsuccessful company and you move in. Okay. And we'll get into this as we go forward tonight. But oftentimes there are problems. And solutions start with an honest appraisal of where you are, that you look at it honestly. It's like raising a child. It's like teaching a person uh, a sport. What you have to do is honestly appraise where you are, look at the shortcomings, and move forward. If you have a problem appraising, if we're out there spinning that we don't have an economic problem, we don't have a job problem, everything is hunky-dory, you don't put solutions together 
to solve those problems. So the first thing is an honest appraisal. And when I've worked with businesses, almost every business or every job I got, it was an opportunity because the person in that job wasn't performing as well as they needed to. Mr. Craig has offered one solution to create jobs, which is to reduce taxes. What I'd like to know is, does that mean you would lay off teachers, you'd lay off police officers, you'd let off, lay off people in the environment? The fact is we have already reduced in these three and a half years by over 500 the number of people in state government. You want to, we'd all love to reduce taxes. What are the choices that you would I make? I have traveled up and down the state and talked to teachers in the public school districts. I've talked to state employees. First of all, there's poor morale. State employees are unhappy with their current situation. They're being asked to do less with more. Are you going to answer the question about how you'd actually reduce the I need a the, quick uh, answer to the question because we're moving the on The quick to our answer next is topic. the place you get the answers is the people who are working in state government. And they often talk about waste. They talk about abuse, and they talk about inefficiencies. And, and I believe on. there's okay. enough in there. We're, we're going to move on. David? All right. So VA loan guarantees, Social Security, mental health programs, low-income programs, student loan guarantees, agricultural support programs are all forms of entitlements. Yet some believe that individuals and groups are becoming too reliant on entitlements and that we need to cut them from federal and state budgets. But during a recession, isn't this the time we actually need these entitlement programs? Sure. It's a counter-cyclical thing. One of the things that happens is when the private economy contracts, if you contract the state government at the same time, you compound the problem, you make it worse. So yes, there are needs for, and I'll give you two, food stamps and unemployment. Both of those are two programs that expand as the economy goes down, and it's absolutely necessary for the government to have the ability to do that. Okay. But at the same time, what government is very bad at doing and this issue about trimming entitlements is trimming those programs down as the economy grows and getting those people off of food stamps because they have job opportunities and getting people back to work. That's the key. And the emphasis shouldn't be on growing those programs or growing entitlements. The emphasis has to be on figuring out how to cut government as we come out of this recession. You have a one minute rebuttal. You know, Hu Hubert Humphrey once said that the, the greatness of a nation is measured in how we treat those in the dawn of life, the dusk of life, and the shadow of life the very young, the very old, and those who cannot care for themselves. And when we dealt with the largest budget shortfall this state has ever seen, $800 million in 2009 in the context of a $3 billion budget, we were committed to making sure that we continued to invest in the things that would lead to long-term prosperity in our state, schools and economic development. We were committed to doing so in a way that was balanced, that there was shared sacrifice, but we were also committed to doing so in a way that we're, we would continue to protect the most vulnerable in our society. And I'm proud that we've been able to do that. We're into follow-up discussion. Yeah, so. Uh, let me tell you, let me, let me, million let, for bike paths. Well, when you well, got a record number let, of people on food Let me follow up stamps. with you on, sure. on your, your statement about uh, the government. Can you exp just explain to Delawareans how you're going to pick and choose wh which entitlements you want to cut, you want to fund more, you want to keep at existing levels? Because you said that as the economy grows, it's going to be time to start cutting. So what's going to be your litmus well, well, test for okay. cutting? Well, the, the litmus test is entitlements for people who need those entitlements. So Jack is right. It's for the young and it's for the old. It's for those who can't provide for themselves. It's what for people the who need that assistance. The unemployed. The unemployed. But the key of the unemployed is to get them employed. Um, and, and, and again, that's the private sector growing. And it's a matter of faith on a certain level. This country has continually grown since it was founded over 200 years ago. And it has grown because it's had a free economy and it's had the ability for people to go out and build new businesses. Apple so your computers. litmus test is going to be faith? No. The, 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 I believe you go to a business owner and you ask them, how do I need, what, what do I need to grow my business? And what they will tell you is they'll tell you they don't need a government loan. They don't need a government handout. We're not what, talking about businesses, are we? Well, yeah, we are, because the, the economic engine is the private sector. And the, when the private sector is growing, the, the government follows along. So if we get the private sector growing, let's go back to Pete DuPont and Mike Castle and the financial services. Well, let me, let me they ask created because, an environment. We're still talking about your litmus test for what entitlements you're going to keep, get rid of, fund more, et cetera. What's going to be your test? There is so much here that I would love to respond to what he, can I, can I respond to If you his? give me a quick answer, I'll let you respond. Well, I think, you know, so many of the, enti so many of the entitlements are at the federal level. An important one here is Medicaid. Okay. Uh, I'm choosing, I believe it's in the best interest of the people of Delaware to expand uh, the Medicaid under the Affordable Care Act. One, because it's 20 to 30,000 additional people who will be covered. Okay. The other is because we're getting a higher reimbursement from the federal government. And the fact is, in the meantime, if those people don't get expanded, Mr. Craig doesn't think we should expand the Medicaid population, they will continue to go to the most expensive place of all, which is the emergency department for service, for, for a treatment. And in the meantime... Is that your policy? A, no, give, well, well it's what misconstrued he said a little bit, but giving people Medicaid doesn't keep them out of the emergency room. They might wind up in the emergency room anyway. It's a matter of training and it's a matter of discussion. It's a matter of having an alternative place for them to go. One of the reasons Jack is so excited about expanding Medicare 
population, it's Medicaid, Medicaid population, Medicaid. Medicaid population, is because the federal government's going to pay for the bulk of it. Well, we all pay for that ultimately, too. That's an expansion of an entitlement program on the federal level that the, that the state government is just riding along as a free rider. Well, all right, first of all, on, on the Medicaid piece, the fact is, in the meantime, if the folks do not have coverage, they cost the rest of this because there's something called uncompensated care. Mm -hmm. And they don't have someplace else to go because nobody will, will pay for them. So they go to the emergency department where the hospitals are required to treat them. That costs us money. It costs us the average fa uh, family that has uh, health insurance is paying an extra $1,000 a year for uncompensated care. That is a fact. And so I think the idea of getting more people covered, particularly when the federal government is paying a higher reimbursement, but but makes sense for Delaware. You're missing taxpayers. one of the key points. When the government reimburses hospitals and providers for medical care, they typically pay about 50 cents on the dollar. As you expand the number of people in there, you're reducing the cost, and that savings that comes from Medicare or Medicaid funding is because the government does not pay its fair share. It sets the reimbursement rates, and it creates more uncompensated care, which is what fuels yeah, medical I, I, inflation. I, 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 we are, we're going to agree to disagree here, and we are going to move on to I our next topic. I don't get to respond topic. to the other stuff about the bike paths and all that. I'd love to talk <laughs> about We'll come back paths. to the bike paths. Perhaps love, we'll love have the opportunity the to do so. Let's move on to the issue of crime, though, because Wilmington's police chief, Michael Zerva, points to what he calls a revolving door of repeat offenders in and out of the city as the root cause of the city's escalating crime rate. Sections of the city, if you drive around, look like they're on the verge of becoming permanent badlands. This is going to erode possibly any hope of the city's much promised and long talked about revitalization. You have said we can't police our way out of it. So are you saying we need drastic measures? No, let me so first of all, I don't run the Wilmington Police Department, but let me give you a sense of what we at the state level are doing. So first of all, our Operation Pressure Point, state troopers working with Wilmington police officers on foot patrol in the city. I've been, I've been out there with them. I've been at 10th and Pine. I've been at uh, East 24th Street, talked to the residents. They love seeing the people out on patrol. That's number one. Number two, what we call a burn grant to pay for two foot patrols by the Wilmington uh, Police Department. We've got the state police working with probation and parole officers as well as youth probation and parole officers to make sure we're focusing our attention on the most violent offenders. So this is still all in the area of, uh, of public safety. The Attorney General's office is making sure that we've got the right prosecutors at bail hearings to, so that folks uh, stay, stay behind bars. And they're also appearing at violation of uh, probation hearings. So that's a, that's a piece of it. There's no question that, a public, that public safety is a piece of it. The other important piece are some of the social issues. This is why we opened up 10 community centers across, this, uh, across the city, the state government paid for, so that kids had a place to go. We opened the curfew center to make sure that kids, when they were out too late, had a place to go. And I believe that some of the investments we're making in places like early childhood education are going to be huge because it's going to make it more likely that these kids have a better path forward. You have a rebuttal now for one minute. Let me personalize it. I was a victim of armed robbery in the city of Wilmington in 2006. I had a store on a Saturday morning, a repeat offender, a armed robber who had was been paroled with a 10-year sentence came in and robbed me at gunpoint. I wound up testifying him. He's now serving a life sentence for armed robbery for his second offense. I understand exactly how this issue works. I know that if that armed robbery had occurred in Greenville on Jack Street, it would have been responded to much more aggressively and much more seriously by the state. It's a matter of leadership and it's a matter of making it a priority. Wilmington will not develop economically until we solve the problem of public safety. Jack has talked about a lot of good things we've done. We haven't done enough. The litmus test is when we don't have the murders and crime, when people feel safe on the streets, when Wilmington is someplace that the people who are sitting in this room tonight would feel comfortable to go to, like they would be comfortable walking around the campus of the University, University of Delaware. Until we get there, we haven't done enough. We're into our discussion. Yeah, that yeah, go is, ahead. First of all, it's offensive. It's offensive to think that uh, you would suggest that we care less about one crime victim than another. And within days, no, let me finish. Within days of that young man being shot on East 24th Street, I knocked on the door of his mother, and I talked to her. I went to, East, I went to 10th and Pine, where he was shot, and talked to dozens of people out on the street to talk to them about what they were looking for and how we can help. And you know, the new mayor, the, the, we expect uh, Dennis Williams to be elected the new mayor. He's made it clear that this is a top priority for him, and I look forward to working with him. What I didn't hear is what you would do. Well, well you first of all, let me address the offense. I'm measures. offended you're offended. 
because at the end of the day, what it really comes down to is assessing the problems. And if we can't have a discussion about crime in the city, and we can't have a discussion about it being treated differently in Greenville than it's treated in Wilmington, it's just a fact. It's the way it is. And so let's face it. Are you making a case for profiling? Is that what you're No, saying? it's not profiling at all. It's, it's well, maybe geographic profiling, but I'll tell you, walking down the street of Newark or walking down the street of Wilmington is a different experience. And, and the level of policing is different. I spent seven years with a store in Wilmington. The level of crime that is tolerated on the street is not co tolerated where my store is in North Wilmington. If somebody stood on a street corner yelling or screaming and being disorderly, they would be a, that problem would be addressed immediately by the state Let's police let in North Wilmington. It is well, not look, addressed in the city of Wilmington. Look, he, you have not laid out a single idea during this entire campaign other than lower taxes. So what would you do? I mean, I told you, we have Operation Pressure Point. And, we've, and got we should, the, we've got and, the burn grant. You should have moved the state police in there earlier, and you should have been more aggressive with the city of Wilmington in getting their acquiescence or their agreement well, to additional resources. That, that, that reflects, a, 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 frankly, a lack of knowledge about the jurisdiction and, and the, the cooperation that's needed between the city uh, and the state police. We talked about the work the Attorney General's office is doing. We talked about the cooperation between the uh, probation and parole officers and the state police and the youth probation and parole officers. Do you have a single idea, a single uh, new idea? I, one of those pro parolees robbed me. I haven't, I, you know, I understand you, you exactly have, how that works. You have works. a single suggestion. I, I have a suggestion. We have to be, well, we have to do a better job with mini, minimum mandatory sentences. We have to keep the career criminals and the people who we've identified that are repeat offenders in prison and in jail. You know, we call it the Department of Corrections, but it's really, we house a lot of these people. They're tough problems, I understand. One of the huge problems is substance abuse. We need more substance abuse programs to assist them. But at the end of the day, it's not an effective program. Okay, so we're going to lower taxes, increase substance abuse. Lower taxes, more police on the street. I mean, I would just like to understand how all this fits together, and if you have any, uh, any specific ideas, and then how are you going to pay for them? Well, we pay for them for being more efficient. And, and you know, I know you're setting this up that, oh, I've done a lot and you're not doing anything. But, but being down there in the city of Wilmington on a daily basis, I've experienced it firsthand. You haven't experienced it firsthand. When you come down into the city of Wilmington, you come in with an entourage. You don't, you know, you, you, you know. Well, you don't. Me, it sounds to me as though you have lost faith in Wilmington. I'm someone that's, I still go into the city. I worked for many years in the city. But it sounds like you have lost no, faith I, 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 in I have, I have breakfast in the city two or three times a week at, at my normal breakfast spot. I enjoy going down there. But I'm a six foot five, 275 pound male. When I'm robbed at gunpoint, you can understand why women don't feel comfortable going into Is the city. Wilmington the most dangerous place in the state of Delaware? Uh, I wouldn't say the most dangerous place. We have some issues in some of the communities in southern Delaware where it is Can you tough give us an neighborhood. Example, tough um, neighborhood? Seaford and Laurel. Okay. You know, we have, have have a huge percentage of the population in Laurel that's okay. in poverty. You know, it's it's not just the city of Wilmington. Okay. But we're I think gonna, but the city of Wilmington is much larger and it's more concentrated right. and it's easier to see that. We're moving on now. David's going to pose our next talk next right, topic. So, so the next topic is about uh, health care. According to national statistics, there are about one hundred and eighteen thousand persons, roughly. Uh, including 19,000 children in the state who are not covered by health insurance. And this is for Mr. Craig. How acceptable do you find this? Do you have any ideas for expanding coverage? Uh, is there something you can tell Delawareans about how they'll they'll? Sure. Uh, sure. I worked for 24 years in the health insurance field. One of the big issues we have is when we mandate minimum benefits, we make the cost much more expensive, we make health insurance much more expensive, and we wind up covering less of the population. One of the things we should do immediately is open up purchasing of health insurance across state lines. Um, Delaware is one of the least competitive insurance marketplaces for health insurance. Um, we have a worldwide market for our chicken products. We have a worldwide market for employment. But we have a health insurance market that if it's not manufactured in Delaware, if it's manufactured in Pennsylvania or Maryland, you can't purchase it. That causes a problem and makes health insurance less affordable. So we need to come up with policies, different solutions, less benefits, streamlined policies, high deductible policies that make it affordable. When we, br when we bring those people into the system, and more people are private pay people, there's more money flowing in the system, there's less government pay. And remember, the government you know, creates a market imbalance because it doesn't pay 100 cents on the dollar. It typically pays 50 cents on the dollar and creates this need for uncompensated care, which drives up the cost of health insurance. Um, what we need to do is get more people paying in a situation financially where they can pay for their own care. There are always going to be a segment of the population that can't pay for their own care, and that's the government's role to cover those folks. But the folks that can pay for their own care or we can employ and get them up and running, those are the people we need to have a private solution 
just like we do in all the other industries. There's nothing special about healthcare that we cannot solve the problem with market forces. You have a one minute rebuttal. Well, the, the main goal of the Affordable Care Act was in fact to address this, this issue about people who were having difficulty accessing care. So when the Affordable Care Act is implemented across the country and here in Delaware, we will address the significant majority of that issue. That being said, I think the bigger issue is we've really got to move away from what is, has become a sick care system where providers get paid based on how many procedures they, they do and move toward a health care system where providers get paid based on whether they keep people well at an affordable value. We have such a, I don't know of any other industry where there's such a disconnect between what we feel in our pocketbook and the service that we get. For most of us, if a doctor tells us to get an MRI or a CAT scan, we'll get it and we'll have no idea what it costs because we won't feel it in our pocketbook. So this idea of moving away for fee, from fee-for-service, I think it's something that's going to be important for us to do. We're into discussion. Let, let me ask a, a quick follow-up. Mr. Craig said uh, allowing people to buy insurance across state lines. Explain how easy or difficult this is. Do governors have to agree? Do state legislatures have to agree on rules for this? How do you make something like this happen? I'm not, I'm not really troubled by the idea of buying across state lines. I mean, the fact is there are a lot of people in Delaware who work for companies out of state who essentially have their coverage from out-of-state uh, providers. That's not, I mean, I think that's, you know, certainly an idea uh, that's worth looking at. And, and what is it? It's, it's about empowering consumers. When a consumer knows what some uh, care is going to cost. Um, a few years ago, I was mowing the lawn. I bent over. I injured my back. I wound up at a chiropractor. I had $2,500 in bills within five days. I was shocked at the cost of that care. What I would have done. And you're in the healthcare industry. And I'm in the healthcare industry. Right. Um, so, so what there is is there's not transparency, there's not good knowledge. We aren't good consumers. But the Affordable Care Act moves us the wrong direction. Should we should we legislate information then? Because you say if, as long as consumers can make good. We don't we don't legislate information in the purchasing of an automobile. We don't legislate information in purchasing of a home. People are quite capable of making a lot of decisions for themselves. Because companies don't take advantage of them. Well, well, what happens in the healthcare industry is it's very complex. And when you are sick and you are ill and you are laying on your back in a hospital, you're not in the best position to, to, to negotiate price or negotiate care. Or read a pamphlet. Or read or a pamphlet or do whatever else. Right. So part of this is about educating people before they go in and putting them in We're a position in where they can be in yeah, so a Look, I think the transparency is, a, is actually very valuable, but the challenge is if people don't have to pay for it themselves, which is true for a lot of people depending upon their coverage, the transparency isn't sufficient. So I think really looking at the way we do this, the payment mechanism, moving away from fee-for-service is an important part of that. You asked about the information exchange. We just celebrated the fifth anniversary of what we call our Delaware Health Information Network. Uh, all, of these, all of the hospitals, uh, the long-term care facilities, most of the providers have signed up. And the way it's going to work, the way it's working and will work, if you go to a physician and you've had an x-ray done someplace else in the state, instead of now having to go get a, you know, the, the film version of that, physicians or uh, hospitals will be able to actually call that up online. I mean, I think there are a lot of efficiencies that will be created as a result of much better information exchange, and I think that's real positive. And it's the first statewide information exchange in the country. We have just a bit of time. Delaware still continue. has over 100,000 people not covered, right? Are there any other states that might be doing it better we can, we can model? We can learn. I mean, I think, and uh, of course, one of the ironies here is that Massachusetts is one of the states where fewer people are covered because of the, uh, the act that Mitt Romney created in that state. Essentially, the Affordable Care Act that uh, President Obama pushed and is now the, the law is modeled on that. And so I think there will be a lot, a lot of states will be following in, uh, essentially in that model. Are you suggesting maybe a mandate here? Well, we have that, that's what the Affordable Care Act does. It's essentially it's now a federal mandate. Okay. And I don't support it. Yeah, we, we are out of time on this. We're going to move on to our yeah. next topic with respect to both of you. All right, so I'm going to put this to you. Beyond the governor's office, there's a lot of chatter about your longevity in this office should you win a second term. Everything from a cabinet post to being at the ready should there be a shift in Delaware's congressional delegation. You have risen to a leadership position with the National Governors Association. You've been touted as a leader among Jewish elected officials, and you spoke at your party's convention. I know that your opponent has talked about a pledge. I don't want to get into the pledge. What I want to know, because clearly, if you are reelected, you're a lame duck. By Delaware law, you have the four years, and that's it. What is your plan beyond the next four years? I love this job. We have significant work still to do to put people back to work, to continue to, to continue to improve schools, to continue to make this state all that it can be. I can't wait to get to work and spend every day of the next four years doing exactly that. Beyond that, I don't have plans. You know, when 
When we get to 2016, uh, my wife, Carl, and I, who's out, out there somewhere, uh, we'll talk about what comes next. I, I'm not thinking beyond that. I th this, is, this is one of those jobs. Being governor is about, is the best job you can have if you want to be in public service, because you can actually get things done. And I love the folks in our congressional delegation, but you know, they always say that the, the, the worst day in Delaware is better than the best day in Washington. And they're right, because we work together here. We can get, stu we can get things done. So I have, I, what I want to do is focus on this job every day for the next four years, do the very best I can so we can continue to drive Delaware forward. So I'm not getting an answer? That, 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 that is the answer. I've absolutely, I've, I, we've spent no time whatsoever thinking about talking about what comes after 2016. Yeah, but I, I want to make sure what well, I Well, I want to give you your time for your one minute rebuttal just to let you know sure. the clock will be on for your one minute. Um, I'm not going to need it in one minute. I, what I've heard is you're going to stay for the next four years, like I would stay for the next four years, no matter what opportunities came. I, well, I think what I said was right. I, lo I love this job. I wake up every day focused on how we can uh, drive uh, Delaware uh, forward, and uh, I look forward to serving four more years, and that's, that's my expectation. I, I, I commend the governor on saying you'll stay for four so years. So you have deferred your rebuttal? I've deferred All my right, rebuttal. All right, so let's get into the conversation. You have been very critical of his role on the national scene. And you also, though, have been called the sacrificial lamb in this particular election because he was named at one point as uh, being least in jeopardy of not earning re-election. And in fact, if you even take a look at your website, it hasn't really been updated much except for a call for interns back in August. And your campaign hasn't raised a lot of money. Why is your campaign somewhat tepid? Is it because of a fractured Republican Party? Oh. coming on after the last election? There's a number of issues, but one of the things is I like to use the analogy of having played football. You know, you don't enter into a football game because you're guaranteed to win. You enter in because it's competition and, and both sides have to compete. Delawareans deserve the choice in this election. We have different views. Um, you know, sometimes Jack chafes at, at my view, it's different, but having this discussion is very, very important. Elections are about choices. Not everybody agrees with all the governor's positions. We have an economic malaise we have to get out of. Um, I am happy taking on the role of being the loyal opposition, working with a Republican Party that's not as strong as the Democratic Party. They have more registered voters than we do. Uh, Jack has way more money with the power of incumbency than I do. But I don't think at the end of the day those are all the issues. The issues actually are about giving people choices, and I think this election is going to do that. We're into moderated discussion. I, I just asked, like to ask, we, we asked Mrs. Uh, Valenzuela about your relationship, and, and I guess we want to know, are you all a ticket? Mr. Den and Mr. Markell seem to be a ticket. Are you, is the Republican ticket real in Delaware? Sure, I think it's real. And, 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 and the way to do that, I was part of the discussions, and Cher was involved in it, when we made the decision, and she decided to run for lieutenant governor. We didn't put her on the ticket for lieutenant governor because she was going to parrot my ideas, or she was a clone of me. We put her on the ticket because she was an independent woman, and she brought a different perspective and a different set of thoughts and background to the job. Do you all share philosophy and ideas? And um, we're it's, both it's, business owners. Yeah. We're both Republicans. We both believe in limited, smaller government. Why not campaign together? Why not run on that? Well, well again, again, we're at a disadvantage. I mean, I mean running for all us. All the more reason to run together. Well, well, well but also, what we let do me, is... Let me ask Mr. Markell to get involved here because well, let me, we are in moderate. I, I just discussion. want to say how much I've appreciated the partnership with Lieutenant Governor Den. You know, I've known him a long time. And he has been a spectacular lieutenant governor. He's been focused on small business. He's been focused on making sure uh, we do right by kids with disabilities. He's, he's been focused, you know, on sort of issue after issue after issue. He has been an absolutely first-class partner, and I just I'm really grateful that uh, I have the opportunity with him. Why to run do you again think there's been so much discussion about you not filling out the four years? Where do you think that's coming from? I don't know, and you know, I just I mean, I, the the Republican Party chair asked me to sign a pledge. I don't respond to pledge requests by Republican Party chairs. What I do is wake up every single day focused on how we can put more Delawareans back to work, how we can continue to improve schools, and I hope the, the conversation turns to education, how we can improve the quality of life, and I hope we turn back to bike paths because, uh, you know, seriously, I, can, I think this is an important issue. You can have 30 seconds okay. on bike paths. We're in a global war for jobs. There are, according to Gallup, there are three billion people in the world looking for jobs. There are 1.2 billion jobs available. So we are literally in a global war for jobs. Jobs are going, which really means we're in a global war for talent. Jobs are going to go where the talent is. 
And talent is defined by the quality of schools. It's defined by the quality of workforce. And it's defined by having nice outdoor spaces to enjoy. So when Mr. Craig disagrees with the idea of spending $13 million on bike pass, government is in a unique position to do that. The private sector is not going to be investing in bike pass. And when we want to make this state more and more attractive to people who are already here, or people may, who may look uh, to come here from elsewhere, having fun things to do with your family, having nice outdoor spaces to enjoy, I'm, pr I'm proud of that. My one minute rebuttal on bike paths? Uh, well, you actually brought up bike paths, so that was his one minute rebuttal, Absolutely. but I need to shift things back over. Well, very to... quickly, bike paths are exactly, I mean, 30,200 unemployed people, 50,000 underemployed people, 152,000 people on food stamps, and we've decided is, to spend $13 million on bike paths. Which is what it's you noted priorities. earlier, so I do need to Thank cut you. it off and turn it over to the issue of education. All right, so, uh, Mr. Craig, there's a very serious racial gap in educational outcomes for the state of Delaware. Right, African Americans make up 32% of high school students in the public school system, but make up 45% of all high school dropouts. You can contrast this with white students who make up 58% of high school students, but only 43% of high school dropouts. And interestingly enough, surveys on engagement and encouragement and parental involvement uh, from the perspective of students doesn't show much difference. So can you reassure the 192,000 African Americans in the state of Delaware uh, that they're going to get a high quality education from Delaware public schools? Um, I don't think we're giving African Americans a high quality education in public schools today, and we need to do more. To, to put emphasis on that so that all children are treated equally. Exactly. I, I have two children who recently graduated from uh, the Brandywine school system. The Brandywine school system is about a third African-American students. A large number of those students are bused from the city to schools that are not really neighborhood schools. It's difficult. Their parents who work in the evening don't have the opportunity to be as engaged in their education as some of the parents who live right around those schools. That's a problem. Now, I'm not about sit, ra racially segmenting schools. Um, by moving those schools back in the city, but we have to have a, find a better way to engage those parents. Uh, I remember when my children were young in the first and second grade, young African American students would come to school and fall asleep, you know, early in the day. They got involved in that with the PTA because essentially what was happening is their parents were night shift, wanted to visit with their mom and dad. They would be up late into the evening. They would not get to bed till one or two o'clock in the morning. They'd wake them up at six o'clock to get on the bus, and they'd be retired that when they would be in school, and the school would shuffle them off to the nurses' These office. These are the African American. African, students? African well, they could have been white students, not necessarily African American students, but students who are riding the bus in an inordinate amount of time to get to school. We had a fight in Brandywine Hundred about reinstituting neighborhood schools, and neighborhood schools finally were instituted where kids didn't have to ride the bus as much. But I think there's a lot of things we have to do creative, creatively for the students. It's a different population and there are different needs. It's your opportunity for a one minute rebuttal. You know, Secretary Arne Duncan says, and I agree, agree with him, that education is a civil rights issue of our generation. We are making progress in Delaware in terms of narrowing the achievement gap and it's something that we keep a very careful eye on. As we narrow the achievement gap, we want to do it by raising the achievement of all students and that's exactly what we're doing. You know, I'm more excited about what's going on in public schools in Delaware today than I've ever been. And my wife, Carla, and I graduated, went all the way through the schools right here uh, in Newark, but I'm more excited today. We came in first place two and a half years ago and raced to the top. We were really excited about that. It's one thing to win a competition, and now we're implementing it, and we're making progress. We just announced a few, uh, two months ago, that for the school year ended in June, 10,000 more kids proficient in reading, 9,000 more kids proficient in math than the year before. I just, and in addition, I, to, I just want you to speak to the racial difference. So, on the, on the, so we narrowed that achievement gap. Yes. I, I thought you were asking about all, all the folks in well, well, I'm interested in the, the gap itself. Uh, the, the other, we, are the, now, we now have okay. edged into the, our the, moderated discussion. The other discussion. really significant investment that we're making, which will uh, help African American, and lots of kids in the state, but it will certainly help a lot of African American kids, is our significant commitment to early childhood education. We're going to be increasing. Over the next five years, from 20 to 80, the percentage of high-need kids in Delaware who were enrolled in a quality-rated preschool, that's a game changer. You know, if you've ever met a five-year-old kid who's already a couple years behind their peers, it's a tragedy every single time. And there's evidence that shows the most effective economic development investment that a state can make is in early childhood education. Because we've increased the reimbursement, what we're saying is two things. First of all, the, the early childhood centers that were already really good now it's now financially it's now a financially responsible decision for them to admit kids that otherwise would not have been able to afford it because we've increased the reimbursement and for the for the centers that were not as good 
they now have the financial wherewithal to make improvements so that they're actually going to move up the quality let's, as let's well. Let's go back to reality. I just spent a, a uh, time at a seminar the Riddell Foundation puts on for candidates and elected officials where the Secretary of Education, Murphy, discussed the goal of the Department of Education, which is to graduate children from high school who are workforce ready or college ready. The, num the percentage of children who graduated in June of 2012 was 47% workforce ready or college ready, which means every kid who's meeting the goal of the State Department of Education, we have a child who's not. And I would also tell you that disproportionately, African American students fall into the category of not college ready and not workforce ready. We don't have enough opportunities. One of the things I think we need to do, and yeah, early childhood education is important, but those children will not get through the system for 12 years. What we need to do is look at expanding community college opportunities by adding a 13th year to high school, where students could make the how commitment. Much, how much would that cost? I don't know what's going to cost, okay. but, but, it, but, but, but if we have to raise taxes to attack the achievement gap for African American students, I think that's a sale or a pitch that I can make as a Republican who's anti-tax and for smaller government because it's going to add economic growth and it's going to have a payback that's going to work for Delawareans. All right, so I mean, I mean, I mean you know, I'm not this ridiculous off in left field, taxes are bad, um, uh, government services are good, and that's only the way it works. I mean, there, there, are, there are shades here, Jack. But importantly, I think we can do that. And so what you do is in 10th grade, you declare yourself. You'll stay in high school for a fifth year. That fifth year, you're awarded an associate arts degree. What happens to children now who graduate from high school, who go to Dell Tech, the three-year graduation rate with an associate arts degree is 7%. And just so we're clear, we were talking about high school dropouts. So, but we're even we're talking about kids who graduate from high school are never going to have the opportunity yeah. to get We're about to wrap this up, so we're going to give you the last word on this very if, quickly. If I could, on the issue of high school dropouts yeah. specifically, so clearly, so first of all, we are making progress. The other thing I want to mention, we've got a terrific program in Delaware started by Pete DuPont 30 years ago, Jobs for Delaware Graduates. It now exists in 32 states. I'm the national chair. 93% success rate keeping the most at-risk kids in school to graduate. Believe it or not, we are out of our question and answer portion from David and I for tonight's debate. We are now going to move in to the questions that come to us from students at the University of Delaware and Delaware State University. And our first question brings up the issue of gay marriage. In my opinion, it's a civil, right, a civil rights abuse to deny two people who love each other the right to get married. If a bill came up proposing the legalization of gay marriage in Delaware. How would you respond? Mr. Markell, your first one minute. Okay, so first of all, uh, I support it. Uh, you know, f f four years ago in the state when I t became governor, it was legal in Delaware to discriminate on the basis of sexual orientation, literally. We changed that. In my first few months in office, we changed that, signed a bill to make it illegal to, to discriminate on the basis of sexual orientation. In the spring of 2011, I uh, signed a civil unions bill in front of 600 people, and I asked all the children of those same-sex couples to come up on the stage. And I explained to them that in large part, I was, assigning, I was signing the bill for them, so that they knew that in the eyes of the state, what they already knew, that they were a family, that we knew they were a family, that, their, that the love that they had from their parents was the love that we recognized in the state. And this is an issue that Mr. Craig and I disagree on. I support uh, legalization of same-sex marriage. Mr. Craig does not. You have one minute. I, I disagree. I think it's a religious issue, and I believe when we call it marriage, a marriage is between a man, one man and one woman, and I believe we have a large segment of the population that has religious beliefs, and civil unions essentially do the same thing as, as uh, the connotation of marriage. I believe we need to be respectful, we need to be non-discriminatory, but that religious uh, connotation of marriage, I respect, and I believe what we should do is have civil unions, we should be respectful of people, who, who wish to be joined through a civil union, but marriage should be a religious function, and we should not open up marriage to, to uh, same sex. Sophomore environmental science major Becky Bronstein has our next question. Drilling for natural gas has already begun in the upper Delaware River. Even though natural gas is a cleaner burning fuel than coal, there are still environmental impacts like air and water pollution, habitat destruction, and stormwater runoff. Do you support? hydraulic fracturing for natural gas and are you proposing any regulations or policy to protect the Delaware River? Mr. Craig, you're first. Uh, I support fracking. Um, I, I guess my, my position would be the same as Ed Rendell, the former governor of Pennsylvania, who has said environmentalists just have to realize that fracking can be done safely 
and that there are tremendous economic advantages in western Pennsylvania that come from it. Uh, natural gas is a clean, the cleanest of the fossil fuels. It's a tremendous opportunity for us to lower our energy costs, to get America energy independent. So I'm supportive of fracking. At the same time, I want the caveat in there that we have to do it environmentally, in an environmentally sound way. We have to be on top of it. We have to trust and verify that trust. But I'm, my position is exactly the same as Ed Rendell. And do you think the regulations are safe today? I think the regulations are safe today. Okay, so. You have one minute. Okay, so um, this is, for me, this is not so much an ideological issue. Uh, last year, uh, just about a year ago now, when I had a vote on the Delaware River Basin Commission, whether essentially to approve fracking, um, I said I was not prepared to say yes. I had one vote of the five, and because of my vote, uh, it did not proceed at that time. I think, it's, I think the more domestic energy we can produce, the better. I think natural gas has some significant advantages, and I love the fact that we'll create a lot of jobs. But I also think that once you turn this proverbial faucet on, you can't turn it off. And my view was that the regulations, the reason I disagree with Mr. Craig in terms of the regulations, we've studied them. And the regulations between Pennsylvania, New York, other states were not consistent. This has to be driven by the science. And so should I become convinced that we have sufficiently uh, robust protections built in to make sure it's safe, then I could see supporting it. But at this point, I'm not there. Well, let's roll this out a little bit and do some follow-up on environmental issues. Well, I, I, I'm just curious to know, is, is our jobs really the, the uh, most optimal trade-off to this fracking issue? Uh, I'm not sure it's a trade-off. I mean, I, I think, you know, I mean, you know, Let's say, let's say we get, I'm not sure where, where the litmus test is or how far we have to go to satisfy Jack on the issue that fracking can be done safely and environmentally sound. But if we can do that environmentally sound, it's a win-win. It's jobs and it's access By to domestic energy. By environmentally sound, what would, you, what would you think would be safe? Well, let's talk about our Delaware beaches and, and our Delaware bays rather than up in Pennsylvania. I mean, you know, they are a, a treasure to the state of Delaware. There's something that we have to maintain. The reason we have a recreational in industry and people go to the be beaches are beaches because it's environmentally, you know, a, a wonderful place to be. We have to protect that. So if there was evidence that it actually did harm the waters, would you be against fracking? Yeah, I, I think it, the question is drinking water and the question is the environment. And if there is clear evidence that, that you know, we're polluting, we can't do that. Yeah, I mean, this, look, this is our drinking water. And that's why this is such a big issue. And uh, again, I mean, it was a, a very controversial position I took at the time. It was not one that was driven by ideology, but I'm really going to be driven by the science. And I agree with what uh, uh, Mr. Craig said about the Delaware beaches. You know, recently the Natural Resource Def Defense Council ranked uh, two of Delaware's beaches as among the very best in the country, mm -hmm. two, two years in a row. Yeah. Well, we've got a lot of students here at the university who study environmental justice, right. environmental policy. Do you have any advice for them about how to deal with these issues in the state of Delaware? Should, can we keep them here to study the, the environment? Well, one, one of those students is my daughter, who's a student. She's actually at the University of Pennsylvania sitting in there. She's not happy I'm calling on her, but she's uh, very interested in these issues uh, herself. And I, I think, you know, Delaware is a tremendous place. We, gotta, we have beautiful places, beautiful, wonderful environment, uh, and we've got to continue to work hard to make sure that we are protecting that environment, because I actually think that a great environment is a real bonus in terms of economic development. You know, at the time when Russell Peterson, Governor Peterson, passed the Coastal Zone Act. Uh, people thought that was an economic, uh, that was anti-jobs, anti-economic development. It's turned out to be precisely the opposite. Because we have such a beautiful Delaware Bay, businesses want to be here. And the same thing, that's why we're focused on our Bayshore Initiative. Let Bus me, people let me want let yeah, let's put, now, you brought the Coastal Zoning Act, and one of, the, one of the objections I have to is the situsing of Bloom's electric power plant in the coastal zone. I mean, one of the, the, uh, uh, the pollutants is sulfur for the bloom boxes. And, and I think what we've done is we've actually waived all the requirements of the Coastal Zoning Act to put that manufacturing facility that manufactures electricity in the coastal zone. And we, we did it under some crazy theory that this was green energy. And so I, I would say, you know, Jack, you know, let's follow Gover Governor Peterson's lead. Uh, that bloom facility should not be in the coastal zone. We're going to move on to our next student question, and we're going to just close that one out. A freshman at the University of Delaware brings us to education issues. Hi, my name is Bennett T. I'm a graduate of the Charter School of Wilmington and a student here at the University of Delaware. My question regards capital funding for charter schools. Charter schools receive about an average of $1,000 less than public schools per student in funding. Would you support capital funding for charter schools? Why or why not? You're up first, Mr. Craig. Uh, I would support capital funding for charter schools. I mean, I think charter schools form a role, and I think what we need to do is we need to have a, a range of options for parents, a range of options for students. Um, 
but, but there's a caveat in there. Right now, charter schools, the funding cost is a little bit lower per student than it is for the public schools. But I think there's some legacy costs that the public schools have that make the charter schools appear more uh, cost efficient, and they really aren't as cost efficient as they appear at first. But yes, if we're talking about buildings and grounds and facilities, um, the state should take a, a role funding that as well for charter schools as it does for public students. You have one minute. Well, in the interest of full disclosure, my daughter graduated from the Charter School of Wilmington. My son is there now. Uh, and the, the real issue is where does the money come from? And when the charter schools were, charter school law was originally passed in the 90s, it was very clear uh, that capital funding would not be there. We've actually had, we have been in discussions for about the last year and a half to figure out if there is a way uh, to provide funding for uh, charter schools. Whether we get there or not, I don't know. It would certainly be nice, but in the meantime, uh, we, you know, we have very challenging financial circumstances, and the question is where the money would come from. Maybe cr Mr. Craig, since he was willing to raise taxes before, maybe he'd raise taxes um, for I, this I, issue I, as well. I sat on the Neighborhood Schools Committee in, in the Brandywine 100 schools when they were looking at school efficiency, and there were school buildings that had less than 50% capacity. The way the school district counted capacity, they had large sections of school buildings that they just didn't count as capacity. And when we went back to the principals, and we had the principals determine what their school capacity was, we all of a sudden wound up with way more capacity, and Brandy 100 just closed schools as part of that study. I think, I think there's opportunities for us to be more efficient with school buildings, or put charter schools in So that in takes us into schools. a different direction. Let me give you about 30 seconds to respond on that part. Well, you are now starting to see, and I, I think the Brandy one thing was a few years back, but you are now starting to see a lot of private school and parochial school parents starting to send their kids back to the uh, public schools, which I think is great. I think it's, uh, uh, they see the improvements that are making. I think for some families, it's probably driven economically. But in the meantime, it's a great opportunity to, for us to show what we're doing. As I mentioned before, we're already making progress. In, in one, one full year of implementation, the race to the top, 10,000 more kids proficient in reading, 9,000 more kids proficient in math. All right, we're going to move on to our next student question, and this comes from a student at Delaware State University who poses a question about crime prevention. What policies would you put in place to prevent first-time juvenile offenders from becoming adult offenders? Mr. Markell, you're first. I think it's a, it's a great question. And a lot of it, I think, has to do with, um, you know, what kind of educational opportunities we're providing these kids. And although, for example, the, the investment in early childhood education, you know, may not make a difference next week, those kinds of investments are going to be paying off over time. The same thing in terms of the overall improvements we're making in schools. The same thing I mentioned earlier, the opening of community centers. You know, when I went, when I go into the city and talk to families and talk to kids, they're certainly looking for things to do, which is why we opened the, the 10 community centers uh, across the state. Um, I also think, you know, for a lot of these kids, giving them a sense of what their future can actually be. And for a lot of them, I think it's difficult. I mean, they're growing up in, in, in situations where they don't necessarily uh, see uh, what, what it is that they can achieve. I think, you know, providing more internship opportunities, more mentorship opportunities, really giving these kids a chance. My wife, Carla, has been mentor mentored a young man since he was in second grade. He's now a freshman at Delaware State University. And it is incredible how much influence and what a positive impact a single mentor can be. We'd love to see more mentors in Delaware. You have as well. one minute. Yeah, we talked about this the other day in the debate, and I think I agree with Jack. One of the key things is, is, and I have this with my own children, and I think everybody who's a parent has these challenges, having children realize the opportunities that are available for them and to see the difficult things they have to do in, in junior high or in high school to move forward. The other thing I'm concerned about is criminalizing youthful bad behavior. Uh, the internet is out there today. Our records follow us. Um, you know, you know, running for office, Jack and I, anything we've done in the age of the internet is out there where somebody can discover it. I'm concerned about what children will do when they're 15, 16, 17 years old, that those come back and haunt them. So we have to find a way to, to deal with that effectively and so that people who actually may stumble and pick themselves up are not penalized for long-term periods of time for what was a youthful indiscretion. Let's talk a little bit then about where Delaware stands as far as juvenile correction, because I think we're, what, within 15 years of, of a major overhaul in how that system was handled. Do you feel that juvenile corrections in Delaware is where it should be, so that we will not necessarily graduate from, let's say, the Ferris School to Gander Hill? I think we've made some very significant progress, and I give a lot of credit to former governors who got us on this, uh, got us on this path, and I give a lot of credit to the people working within uh, these institutions. To see the, I mean, and I've met a lot of these kids. I go into Ferris, I've gone into Stevenson House, I've gone into uh, some of the other institutions and met these kids, listen to them about their stories. 
listen to them about their issues, and then I meet them six months later or a year wet later when they come out. And their stories are moving. I give a lot of credit, actually, Vice President uh, Biden's daughter, Ashley, works for the state and has created a remarkable, pro remarkable program. It's a partnership between Habitat for Humanity, the building trade unions, the faith-based uh, community, taking kids at Ferris and elsewhere, teaching them uh, construction skills, getting them out into the community. And when you meet these kids afterwards, I mean, they are glowing. Certainly, we've always got work to do, and I think every time that somebody, every time a kid goes into one of those uh, facilities, We've got to work even harder so that we can work ourselves out of Your assessment of the juvenile well, well, justice I don't want to have a kumbaya system. moment. I mean, there are children who are in these programs, and these programs are very, very, very successful. We need to continue to fund them. But there are children that are not successful who are actually graduating from the Ferris School and going on to Gander Hill. And we need to identify who those children are early and make sure that we take corrective action. It's carrots and sticks. It's not all carrots. And I misspoke. I should apologize to Gander Hill, which is now the Howard Correctional Facility. Howard Young. Is some old habits die very, <laughs> very hard. Gentlemen, that is all we have for questions and answers from students and from us. It is now time for your closing statements. And you are up first, Jeff Craig, with your closing statements. I, I want to thank you, the audience, for being here tonight, and thank the two of you for uh, your kind questioning and, and Jack for participating in this event. Um, I really do think this election is about the economy. It's about jobs. It's about people on food stamps. It's about changing the direction we have in the state. Part of that is an honest assessment of where we are as a community and where we are as a state. If you poll folks, it's always jobs in the economy. We're not providing enough, enough opportunity. And what we did with $21 million to Fisker for a plant that has no jobs, $19 million to Bloom, for a plant that does not exist just down the street at the uh, Chrysler Building. If we had taken that $40 million and put it into Delaware businesses, the expanded growth here, we would be much farther along on this track. So I think we need to change the focus of what we've done with economic development, focus much more on Delaware businesses, organic growth here in the state. We do that under a Craig administration, we're gonna have better results. So I ask for your indulgence and your vote. And your closing statement, Jack Markell. When Chrysler and General Motors and Valero closed their facilities, we had a choice to make. We could fight hard to put people back to work and get people making things in Delaware again, or we could give up on those workers. And if Mr. Craig's approach were followed, what we would have now is an empty building, a decaying factory, and a rusting refinery. I was going to fight for those workers, and I will continue to. You know, when I was first running for governor, I could not have imagined that Lehman Brothers was about to collapse or that major pillars of our economy were about to close down and lay off all their workers. But that's what happened. And in Delaware, that changed everything. We've pulled together over these last four years. I'm proud of how we've pulled together. We really are a state of neighbors, but we've got significantly more work to do. We're going to do it, and that's why, once again, I ask the people of Delaware for their confidence and for their vote. Candidates, thank you. David Wilson, thank you as well. And to our audience here, at Mitchell Hall, we appreciate your attention as we talk about the issues in the race for governor for the state of Delaware. On behalf of Delaware First Media, WDDE 91.1 FM, and the University of Delaware Center for Political Communications, I'm Nancy Karabjanian. We thank you so much for being with us, and good night. Delaware Debates is a joint initiative of the University of Delaware's Center for Political Communication, and WDDE 91.1 FM, Delaware First Media, with support from AARP Delaware and the American Cancer Society.